have so much time, so without further ado, I'm your host Amanda, and this is me attempting to explain the entirety of the X-Men. To really understand this team, we have to go all the way back to their humble beginnings over at Marvel Comics. The team supposedly came to be thanks to a group you're quite familiar with. No, I'm not talking about Marvel, and no, I'm not talking about legendary duo Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. I'm talking about us. The fans. Well, I mean, not me specifically, as I was not alive back in 1963. But the fans who were around back then and reading comics had a need, a need for more Marvel team books. There were many solo hero books out there, but fans wanted to see more team ups. And so Stan Lee and Jack Kirby came up with the X-Men. Stan Lee had said before that the challenge with team books where new characters were introduced was explaining how they all got their powers, their origins. To simplify this, he had an idea of making the entire team a group of mutants, using that same blanketed reason to explain how they each got their powers. Pretty easy, you can just say, hey, they're mutants. The brilliance of this is that while on paper this sounds like an easy, even lazier approach to some, it actually worked. A huge part of the reason why the X-Men were so successful and why we love them even today is because of their mutant status. Initially, Stan wanted to give them a simple name, denoting this status, the mutants. But publisher Martin Goodman turned down the name idea, citing the fact that no one knew what a mutant was. Some even believed that the name, the mutants, could still be used as a good alternative name for the group when they debut in the MCU, but we'll have to wait to find out about that. Instead, Lee decided to take inspiration for the team's name from their leader and mentor, Professor X, calling them simply the X-Men. In those early comics created by Kirby and Lee, Professor Charles Xavier, or Professor X, as he'd come to be more commonly known, created a school for young mutants, guided by a dream of peaceful coexistence with humankind. You see, the public was not a fan of mutants, and there were many evil mutants out there that gave mutant kind a bad rap. To combat this, Professor X decided to create a school for gifted youngsters in Westchester County, New York, bringing together a team of young mutants using his telepathic abilities and Cerebro, which we later learned was actually created by X and his future student, Jean Grey. The initial team and group of students that started it all were Cyclops, Beast, Angel, Iceman, and of course, Jean Grey as Marvel Girl. During these early days, they were also sometimes joined by Mimic, who initially was introduced as a deadly villain that could adopt the abilities and powers of those around him, making him a formidable foe for the X-Men, as he could, you know, mimic all of their powers. However, Mimic would soon after be reformed, and after losing and regaining his powers kind of multiple times, would also end up adopting the OG X-Men roster's power sets permanently. These were the early days of the X-Men, which also introduced one of their greatest enemies, who coincidentally would also throughout the years become somewhat reformed before becoming a full-on anti-hero or even to some, a full-on hero in modern day comics, Magneto, the master of magnetism, and his also quite infamous Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, who themselves would have many various different versions and rosters throughout the years. Eventually, the X-Men series was taken over by Roy Thomas, beginning with issue number 20. Throughout the continuation of the series, other writers would also help out, and we'd see characters like Havoc, Cyclops' heroically reluctant brother, who was also a mutant, and Polaris, who we'd later learn was the daughter of Magneto, having powers similar to him, introduced. This series would be ongoing until issue number 66, where it would come to a firm stop as sales dwindled somewhat. Up until issue 93 of the series, the X-Men title would only exist to sell reprints of older stories. So there's a period there where nothing new is really happening, it's just a lot of reprints. However, with giant size X-Men issue number one, we'd see X-Men return in a big way, finally getting a new tale and ultimately a revival. Len Wein and Dave Cockrum were the creatives behind this first giant size, which would become a Marvel and X-Men staple. In fact, recently in 2020, we saw a new giant size X-Men series emerge in this similar vein. Each issue of that series focusing on a story tied to a different X-Men. In the first ever giant size X-Men issue number one though, a whole new team of X-Men were introduced, featuring Colossus, Wolverine, Storm, Thunderbird, Banshee, Nightcrawler, and Sunfire. Oh, and Cyclops was also there. Although it should be noted, as I talk about the evolution of the roster, I likely won't mention all members every single time to avoid repetition. I'm also not going to mention every single roster because I could just do that in one video and that could be a whole video. 
Suffice it to say, there have been a lot of X-Men rosters that Scott Summers has been a part of as well. If he's not mentioned, he might still be on there. The difference between this team and the original X-Men team was that this team was a lot more grown up. The former youngsters had all grown up and this team reflected that, with all new members also being adults as opposed to teens. The giant size roster was also unique in that each team member was radically different from the other, having a completely different background, power set, and in many cases even country of origin. This was probably the first roster to really reflect another trait many fans love about the X-Men today diversity. In terms of the why behind this team, they were brought together to rescue the original X-Men from the deadly sentient mutant island known as Krakoa. Currently actually an ally to the X-Men in modern day comics, but once a villain in their history. Technically wedged in between this rescue attempt and when the X-Men ended up in peril was another team initially led by Moira McTaggart, but outside of the canon in real world comic history, this team wouldn't be retconned into existence until the early 2000s. It would serve to to help introduce the youngest Summers brother, the quote unquote mystery Summers bro, Vulcan. But back to the giant sized team. They were successful in their rescue mission and afterwards were left to ask the question, now that all the X-Men were safe and sound, new and old, what are we going to do with 13 X-Men? Well, they wouldn't have to worry about this too much as they weren't lucky number 13 for too long. Shortly afterwards, Sunfire left the team in a huff, Thunderbird died on a mission unfortunately, Iceman and Angel ultimately moved out of the X-Mansion, and Havoc and Polaris decided to go back to school. Jean Grey as well also left for a period, kind of returning to school, but her romantic connection to Scott Summers kept her mostly active on the team's roster. Jean would also eventually become the Phoenix, sending us down a path towards one of the most iconic X-Men stories, I would say, of all time, the Phoenix Saga. And of course, the even more iconic follow-up story, the Dark Phoenix Saga. While the adult X-Men team continued on, there were newer mutants introduced, and a second X-Men title was added to make room for them. And and their stories. This new young team of teen mutants had a book whose title reflected just what they were, the new mutants. In a way, calling back to the simplicity of the title Stan Lee had originally thought up. This era is often considered one of the best among fans, with creative team Chris Claremont and John Byrne often standing out as the main folks we think of when we reflect back on these iconic moments and stories. In addition to the Phoenix Saga, there was also Days of Future Past and God Loves Man Kills. Many of the stories you've seen brought to life in film and animated series adaptations are are actually taken from this time period in mutant and X-Men history. Another spin-off title was added at this time to showcase the tales of the original X-Men roster, the most classic of teams. However, because we already had an X-Men team and title, this book and the team within its pages would become known instead as X-Factor. At that time, X-Factor was the old roster returning to action, not yet a mutant detective agency. Despite being what most fans associate with that name now, that version of X-Factor actually wouldn't become known to us until the early 2000s, with X Factor Investigations making its first appearance in Madrox issue number one in 2004, which led into the 2005 X Factor series, which is technically volume three of that series. Even more books would be added to what seemed to be developing as somewhat of an X Men line, I would say. Excalibur appeared as part of Marvel UK's collection of comics. This comic featured three X Men Nightcrawler, Kitty Pride, and Rachel Summers, who teamed up on adventures with Marvel UK superheroes Brian Braddock's Captain Britain and Megan. On. By the time we got to the 80s, we had a completely new roster of X-Men who were featured in the Uncanny X-Men title, which actually is considered to be a renamed portion of the X-Men Legacy series. This new roster featured Storm, Wolverine, Colossus, Rogue, Psylocke, Dazzler, Longshot, and Havoc, among others. Angel, Nightcrawler, Polaris, Banshee, and Kitty Pride Sprite were also present, as was Professor X. This era featured one of my favorite X-Men story epics, Inferno. While the 80s were a pretty magical time for X-Men stories, the party came crashing to a halt somewhat in issue number 251 of Uncanny X-Men, when the team split up. Of course, no cliffhanger here for us living in the retrospective future as we know the X-Men would and did return. In issue number 254, a new team revealed themselves coming together on Muir Island, nearby to Scotland. This roster was made up of both mutants and humans, featuring Banshee, Polaris, Forge, Dr. Moira McTaggart, Professor X's son, Legion, Nightcrawler's magical foster sister, and also romantic 
love interest, Amanda Sefton, Brigadier Sandy Stewart, who belonged to the Weird Happenings organization, aka Who, Tom Corsi, Sharon Friedlander, and very, very briefly, Sunder. This mutant team is often referred to as the Muir Island X-Men. We were also introduced to supporting characters like the Muir Island Morlocks, including Callisto and Healer, and the Freedom Force, which initially featured Destiny, Mystique, and Valerie Cooper, but would kind of become like an alternate brotherhood roster, to be honest. The core X-Men team, however, would stay pretty much broken up until issue number 270, when all mutants were brought together once more in Extinction Agenda to fight against the cyborg Cameron Hodge. Possibly one of the most famed X-Men creative teams of all time started to sort out the current state of the X-Men and their fractured rosters as we moved into the 90s. Jim Lee and Chris Claremont. In issue number 273, we got a story called appropriately, Too Many Mutants. <laughs> Truer words were never spoken, which aimed to rectify all the confusion by finally, finally giving us a new X-Men roster featuring Storm, Wolverine, Psylocke, Jubilee, Gambit, Forge, and Banshee. By 1991, we saw the many mutants coming together once more to take on the evil psionic mastermind known as the Shadow King during the Muir Island saga. After that battle, however, we were once more left with the remnants of three teams all kind of jumbled together. The Muir Island X-Men, the X-Men X-Men, and X-Factor. Once again, at the end of X-Factor issue number 70, we were left with the question, this time asked by Professor X, what am I gonna do with 14 X-Men? No one looks pleased either about this this issue on the page where this question is asked, perhaps because they are all upset that Professor X has maybe forgotten them, as he seems to have miscounted, but I assume this is just supposed to be a play on the 13, and we're just one-upping it, because there's definitely people that are not included in that count, including some who are not pictured here, and you know, Professor X himself. There were likely even more than 14 X-Men now gathered. The solution to this question finally came in the form of creating multiple, actual X-Men teams. Not spin-offs, but instead, two main rosters. This is where the much loved original X-Men gold and blue rosters come in. And this love is in fact proven by sales, with Jim Lee and Chris Claremont's X-Men issue number one being known as the best selling comic of all time. At the time of this recording, there have been a reported over 8 million copies sold, which is pretty wild. The blue team featured Cyclops as leader with Gambit, Rogue, Beast, Psylocke, Wolverine, and Jubilee rounding out the team's ranks, and briefly featuring Revanche as well. The blue team featured more of the edgy and newer X-Men characters, and was written and drawn by Chris Claremont and Jim Lee. Featured in the pages of the second volume of X-Men from 1991, starting of course with issue number one. Although they wouldn't actually be the blue team until like a few issues later in terms of like them just being the mainstay. Think about issue four. The gold team on the other hand featured Storm as leader with members including Colossus, Angels, Archangel, Bishop, Jean, Forge, and Iceman. This team was depicted as the more seasoned and experienced one, showcasing more of the classic X-Men of the 60s and 70s. This team's stories were told in the pages of Uncanny X-Men kicking off with issue number 281 of the series. I personally love this cover. The creative team involved included John Byrne, Jim Lee, and Wilchi Portacio. The costumes showcased with both teams, designed by Jim Lee, became pretty iconic and served to inspire their looks in the 90s X-Men animated series. To this day, they're still my favorite X-Men suits. The 90s was also the time that we were introduced to the mutant black ops team X-Force, who initially started out as kind of like time-traveling assassins made up of the former New Mutants team, who are now being led by big, gun-toting, time-traveling son of Madeline Pryor, Scott Summers, and sort of Jean Grey, from the future, Cable. X-Factor would also continue as a government-funded team led by Havoc and Polaris, and despite the fact that the two mainstay teams were introduced to help simplify the murkiness created by having simply too many characters, the 90s is actually where it gets somehow even more confusing. Despite each team being somewhat tied to a specific X-Men title, these titles both had X-Men in the name, and often stories unfolded and were woven through multiple series, meaning you needed to collect multiple titles to get the whole story. Well, this can be fun at the time of collecting can also be exhausting and expensive and confusing to figure out when you're returning back to older stories. Both teams actually lived in the X-Mansion but simply went on separate missions. Starting in 1993 with Uncanny X-Men issue 298 and X-Men issue number 17, the teams also started to swap members for certain missions, making everything even more confusing for readers to try to discern between the two once very distinct rosters. During this era, however, we did get many memorable and character-defining 
shocking stories including Fatal Attractions, Phalanx Covenant, and The Onslaught Event. But by 1994, the terms blue and gold had kinda lost all meaning, with both teams pretty much melding together. By 1998, the roster had shrunk down to 8 core members, including Wolverine, Storm, Nightcrawler, Colossus, Kitty Pride, Rogue, Gambit, and Marrow, surprisingly, with stories featuring the team continuing to weave back and forth between Uncanny X-Men and the X-Men series, starting with issue number 360 and issue number 80, respectively. Since the 90s, there have been a slew of other important stories as we moved into the 2000s and beyond, including the alternate timeline Ultimate X-Men, E is for Extinction, House of M and M-Day, Messiah Complex and Messiah War, Schism, Avengers vs. X-Men, Inhumans vs. X-Men, and Resurrection. There have also been countless X-Men books featuring multiple teams, many of which simply refer to themselves as the X-Men, even when a mainstay X-Men book was also already ongoing alongside them. Which means we get a lot of stories, but also making sense of the X-Men X-Men roster gets more and more confusing. These titles have included The Amazing X-Men, The Astonishing X-Men, Extreme X-Men, New X-Men, which was the mainstay Stay at the time, known as the Grant Morrison era of X-Men, X-Men Legacy, Young X-Men, Wolverine and the X-Men, which is actually one of my favorites, All New X-Men, which featured the time-displaced OG X-Men, X-Men Gold, Spider-Man and the X-Men, Extraordinary X-Men, the 2017 relaunch of Blue and Gold teams with X-Men Blue and X-Men Gold. And then of course, there were all the books that were simply known as Uncanny X-Men and X-Men, including one volume of the series simply titled X-Men from 2015 that features an all-female roster of mutants led by Storm that I feel like no one really ever talks about for some reason. I still can't believe how seemingly quiet the hype surrounding that series was. And I know that not a lot of people were super here for it, but also, what a cool team! I suppose it all pretty much goes to show you that by the 2010s, people were pretty much overwhelmed with X-Men content, with the mutant hype receding for some time. To give you some more perspective here, despite the initial X-Men series being consistently returned to, sometimes renamed, but often maintaining or returning to actual legacy numbering, we are still also on the sixth volume of the X-Men title with the 2021 series. Pretty crazy to think, considering how long some of those other series went on for. The modern age, however, has seen a great boost to X-Men popularity, and I have to say I feel lucky to be one of the folks reading along through this entire era. In 2019, Jonathan Hickman and Pepe Larraz became the main creative team behind House of X and Powers of Ten, which kicked off the era of X-Men we are in now, which I like to refer to as the Krakoan era. This has been a three-part multi-year saga that is still ongoing, spanning a number of series in the double digits. The three major acts of this epic can be divided between Dawn of X, Reign of X, and Fall of X. Events have included one of my all-time favorites, Ten of Swords, the Marvel-wide crossover AXE, Judgment Day, or Axe, and SOS, aka Sins of Sinister, as well as recurring yearly Hellfire galas, which we can all dress up and attend in our minds. However, the X-Men history and family will continue on, as the Krakoa era is soon coming to a close, with 2023's Hellfire Gala being advertised as the last my heart. First up, the first Summers, Cyclops. Scott Summers was the first of the Summers family tree to appear in the comics. He made his first appearance in the X-Men issue number one in 1963. There Scott was introduced to us as a somewhat self-doubting character who would become a leader but still struggle to see himself as worthy of love and deserving of his own happiness. Scott operated as a part of Professor X's X-Men team under the codename of Cyclops. And when Professor Professor X was called away on a secret mission, Psyche would take his place as team leader, often maintaining a position as leader of the X-Men throughout the years, both in a field leader and commander role. Even today, at the time of this recording, Scott is currently the leader of the X-Men in the current 2022 X-Men comics, almost 60 years later. When we first met Scott, we didn't know very much about his family life or childhood, but as we got to know him, we learned more about how he came to be the Professor's golden boy and his first X-Man, and along the way, we'd also learn about his mysterious childhood and family as well. Who exactly are the Summers? At least in regards to Scott's original family tree, before he grew up, he had his own family, 
which is its own tangled web that we'll attempt to unravel later on. Let's start with the easy stuff. Scott's parents are his father, Christopher Summers, and mother, Catherine Ann Summers. Scott was the eldest in his family, but also had a younger brother, Alex. When Scott was young, his parents seemingly perished in a plane accident. Alex and Scott were saved by their parents who gave them a parachute and got them safely out of the plane. As a result of this near-death experience, Scott would sustain permanent brain injuries that he still suffers from to this day. Scott would not only be plagued by this, but also by nightmares of these events, which he struggled to recall with clarity as a result of the brain damage he suffered that fateful day. We later learned though that Scott's parents didn't die in that exploding plane. Instead, they were actually kidnapped, beamed aboard a Shi'ar spaceship. Christopher Summers was a US Air Force pilot, aiming to become an astronaut, but after being kidnapped by the Shi'ar and escaping them, he became a space pirate, known by the name of Corsair. Christopher is escaped his captors the first time almost as soon as he was kidnapped. At least initially, that's what we were kind of told. But he was recaptured after he tried to rescue his wife, Catherine, who was a and killed by Emperor Deken of the Shi'ar Empire in front of Christopher. Christopher as Corsair would find love again though with Hepzibah. Hepzibah from an alien skunk-like race known as the Mephitisoids would be among the group that would band together to escape Shi'ar captivity and become the star-faring group known as the Star Jammers, which Corsair is the leader of, becoming like a new sort of family for Corsair. Alex and Scott, having no next of kin, would be taken in by an orphan but whose orphanage was it? You may have already guessed. We're talking about a surprise, often unwelcome addition to the Summers family tree, Mr. Sinister. That's right, this is where Mr. Sinister's obsession with the Summers family, chiefly Scott, started. When Alex and Scott were taken into the state home for foundlings in Nebraska, where Mr. Sinister was the head operator. He had his administrator secure the two boys. While Alex was later adopted by Andrew, Andrew and Joanna Blanding, who would legally become his adoptive parents, Scott was not, and he stayed behind at the state home, where Sinister would often run tests on him in secret, becoming more and more obsessed with Scott and his genetics over time. Eventually, however, Scott would run away, running into Jack Winters, known as the superhuman criminal Jacko Diamonds, and would later be rescued from Jack with the help of Professor X, who would then recruit Scott into his school for gifted youngsters, and later his mutant team acting as sort of a father figure to him. Alex, however, wouldn't only receive new foster parents, but also a new foster sister, Haley Blanding, who's also part of our family tree. The Blandings actually adopted Alex to help them heal from the death of their son, Todd Blanding. And in a way, they wanted him to replace the hole that Todd had left in the family, kind of also making him like be the new Todd. Yeah, it's pretty messed up. Unbeknownst to both Alex and Scott, they both had a secret younger sibling. Their sibling was wasn't a secret because you know their parents had like kept their existence from the two boys, but because Kate actually hadn't known she was pregnant at the time of the flight. As she was killed, the baby in her womb was taken from her and placed by Emperor Deken into an incubator accelerator, which caused the baby to grow quickly into a young man. This mysterious younger brother is the man that is known as the third Summers brother, Gabriel Summers. He would become known more commonly though in the comics as Kid Vulcan and then later just as Vulcan. In fact, for many years in comic book history, readers would be left on a cliffhanger surrounding his existence as it was first alluded to by Mr. Sinister back in 1993 in the second volume of the X-Men in issue number 23. However, it wouldn't be till 2005's X-Men Deadly Genesis series that we would actually get to meet this third brother and have his true identity revealed to us. There's also the weirdness that in Deadly Genesis, it's established that Kate was only days away from having the child. Yet, in the original art where she is shown to have been made to join Emperor Deken's harem and then she's killed, she looks very, um, very non-pregnant. There is also the fact that it mentions she was only two months pregnant when first abducted, which actually applies the Corsair's initial escape attempt didn't actually happen as soon as maybe we originally thought it did or it was originally implied if she was only days away from giving birth, so he would actually have been in captivity then for a few months. Aside from that weirdness, we would also learn that Kate also had several children with Emperor Deken, that is 
Genetically speaking, Dekan had these offspring created with the hopes of expanding the genetic potential of the Shi'ar Empire by introducing different kinds of genetics into it. When he was young, Adam was taken from the lab he was created in by Jonath, who became his adoptive father, hiding Adam's true origins from him. Adam would grow up and later become known as Adam Naramani, or codename Adam X. And originally, as he appeared shortly after Sinister alluded to Scott having multiple brothers, not just Alex, it was believed that he was the one, other than Alex, that Sinister was referring to. Adam X was a half brother to Alex and Scott, but later Gabriel would be implied to be, you know, that extra brother, although Sinister could have been talking about both or either for all we know, really. Adam is of course both tied to the Shi'ar royal family and to the Summers family tree, as he would later learn. Between the three brothers, each had their very own different life experiences, which would lead them to having different kinds of families. So before we move on, let's go forward and talk about some of their kids. The Summers children and weird relations. I feel like for the Summers brothers families, it is easier for me to go in reverse order from youngest to oldest. So let's start with Vulcan. Vulcan, after being rapidly aged to his prime years, was enslaved by the Shi'ar and sent to Earth to serve the Emperor's envoy there, but instead ended up escaping and was found by Moira McTaggart, who took him in and had him join her own roster of mutants. His story training with Moira is introduced in Deadly Genesis. Vulcan is known for being the most powerful of the Summer's children. Vulcan would end up in space after being recruited to a mission to save the original X-Men and kind of failing somewhat. Vulcan would return to the Shi'ar Empire, end up imprisoned, freed, married to Deathbird, and later on would also become Emperor of the Shi'ar Empire. Which yes, this does mean that the Naramanis would have become his in-laws, including Deken, who killed his mother, imprisoned his father, and enslaved him. Wow, that's a messed up family right there. Which also makes Adam X both Vulcan's half-brother and his nephew. Pretty wild stuff. Deathbird and Vulcan would have a baby together, although we still don't know that child's name, if it's still around somewhere. Deathbird being a mother was even acknowledged as recently as the fourth volume of New Mutants issue number five from 2020. And well, that's really all there is to Vulcan thus far. Now let's talk about Alex. Alex would grow up to become the mutant hero and sometimes villain known as Havoc. And it's no wonder he sometimes turns a little evil considering how rough his life was both leading up to joining the X-Men and even after that happened. Alex was given his code name and original costume by Larry Trask after being taken captive by his Sentinels. Alex would attempt to refuse to join the X-Men multiple times, but eventually it kind of just became inevitable. Originally, Sinister believed his power levels to be greater than Scott's. Initially, Mr. Sinister actually suppressed Alex's mutant ability when it first manifested when he was a child. He put side blockers on him and wiped his memory of the incident that triggered it, as Alex's powers were considered to be too uncontrollable. They would only be triggered again later when he ran into an X-gene copy of himself in mutant-human hybrid, the living monolith. Yes, the living monolith is here, Amit Abdul, who had been mutated by Apocalypse using Alex's DNA, making him like a genetic brother of sorts who was psychically linked to Alex. Alex would only have one daughter that we know of, Surprisingly, not with any of his more popular romantic ships, but instead with Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp. They had a daughter in an alternate timeline, which has since been wiped from existence. She was pretty adorable and awesome, and her name was Katie, or Catherine Summers. In typical Alex Summers must suffer Marvel fashion, after having half his face melted by Kang, he is the only one left with memories of Katie, so he can't even talk to anyone about it. Janet doesn't even remember being with him or their daughter. I still kind of hope one day that Katie will get to return via the main timeline somehow. Finally, let's talk about the mad complexity that is Scott Summers' family tree, with Jean Grey, Madeline Pryor, and beyond. Although Scott was always sweet on Jean, she became the Phoenix and later Dark Phoenix, seemingly dying, sacrificing herself to save others once she turned dark. It was after her apparent death that Scott met Madeline Pryor, spelled M-A-D-E, L Y N E P R Y O R, probably one of the most commonly misspelled names in all of comics. Madeline happened to look just like Jean. What a coincidence! Scott fell in love with her and left the X Men to settle down with Maddie. Together, the two had a baby, Nathan Christopher Charles Summers, initially referred to in the comics as Baby Christopher. However, their relationship started to deteriorate when Scott decided to return to the new, old X Men team, X Factor, after Jean Grey was revealed to be alive and well, herself joining the team. 
Jean. Jean hadn't died, it turned out, but was simply in a stasis cocoon at the bottom of Jamaica Bay while the Phoenix adopted her form and personality, appearing as her, later seemingly perishing. But of course, this is the Phoenix Force, so we know that that is not true. And you know, it gets even weirder than this. The Phoenix Force, along with Mr. Sinister, were later revealed to be like parents to Madeline, who it turned out was a clone of Jean Grey created from a piece of the Phoenix Force. Surprise, surprise! No wonder she looked almost identical to Jean. This revelation in combination with Scott abandoning her would drive Madeline mad. Feeling abandoned, she would ally herself with Alex Summers and also take him for her lover. He would become known as her Goblin Prince, and she would become the villain known as the Goblin Queen. Aiming to retrieve and later seemingly sacrifice Christopher, who had been taken from her by Mr. Sinister. And it gets somehow even weirder than that! After Maddie was dealt with, Jean would be given memories of raising baby Christopher, so psychically he was like her own child. Baby Christopher would later be taken by Apocalypse, saved by the clan Ascani, cloned, and later grow up across time, becoming a time traveler who we all know as Nathan Summers. Or Cable. Nathan's evil clone, who was raised by Apocalypse, now also weirdly, I guess, somehow in this family tree, would be known as Strife. Cable would rescue the mutant Messiah, meet a woman named Hope, who he fell in love with and married, and name the adopted baby mutant Messiah Hope Summers after his wife and her adoptive mother. His daughter Hope had a biological mother before that who died, which we now know was named Louise Spaulding. Before being with Hope Summers, though, Cable would be married to Aaliyah Dayspring, his first wife, with whom he had a son known as as Tyler Dayspring, aka Genesis. But not Apocalypse's wife Genesis, or Apocalypse's younger clone Genesis, or Apocalypse's alternate universe son Genesis. None of those Genesis. In a weird twist, Aaliyah was also an initiate in the clan Ascani, who originally saved Nathan when he was a baby. The other weird thing about the clan Ascani is Mother Ascani, who saved Nathan as a baby, is also part of the Summers family tree, being a daughter of an alternate reality pairing of Scott Summers and Jean Grey. So Nathan as a baby was actually saved by his alternate reality stepsister, or you know, just sister if you consider Jean to truly also be his mother. Let's rewind back a little bit to after the X-Men beat Madeline prior during the events of Inferno. Scott would end up later married following his disastrous relationship with Maddie, of which he is actually a good deal responsible for, to be honest, to Jean Grey, his first love. They would not have children in the main continuity, but as we already know with Mother Ascani, had children together in alternate realities. Well, I won't mention all all of those children here, two important ones in regards to their interactions with the main continuity are Rachel Summers and Nate Gray. Sometimes known as Ascani or Prestige or Phoenix or Marvel Girl, Rachel Summers is from the same reality as Mother Ascani, Earth 811, the days of future past reality. And Mother Ascani is actually not necessarily an alternate version of her as Rachel was actually split into separate beings across time when she sacrificed herself to save her teammate Captain Britain. Rachel is immensely powerful and pretty previously lived on the blue area of the moon in the Krakoan habitat known as the Summer House. Not residing in the Summer House on the blue area of the moon is Nate or Nathan Gray. Nathan Gray actually has a psychic link with his alternate reality self Cable and is like Cable if he wasn't infected with the techno organic virus, making him kind of like a more perfect being. Nate Gray is actually the genetic offspring of Jean Gray and Scott Summers and was made by his reality's Mr. Sinister, who there is just known as Sinister, although he was also raised by by his reality's forge, so that's kind of like his foster dad. Nate Gray goes by the codename X-Man and is basically like a mutant version of Jesus. He hails from the reality of Earth 295, the Age of Apocalypse reality. Attempt to explain the main family related rumors that exist in the Marvel multiverse, or the Summerverse if you prefer. I mean, Spider-Man has the Spider-Verse, Venom has the Venomverse, With all these summers running around I cannot believe that we do not have a Summerverse established yet. So make sure you put on any safety equipment needed, ruby quartz shades on, as you prepare to once more have your mind blown by the complexity and insanity that is the Summers family tree. Let's go back in time to start. Last time we started with Cyclops and his parents, but this time we're going further back in time, answering the question of who are the Summers family grandparents. When Scott married Madeline Pryor, the two of them became pilots, with Scott moving to Anchorage, Alaska. If you think that sounds random, it actually isn't really at all. Anchorage is actually a place where Scott feels most at home. It's where he grew up before losing his parents and brother and having his life go pretty sideways. His grandparents, Philip and Deborah, were actually both born in Anchorage too. Philip also likely inspired his sons, Christopher, 
Kerr's own passion for flight, as Philip himself joined the U.S. Air Force and even served in World War II. Deborah and Philip were also a driving force, likely, in Madeline and Scott's choice to settle down and become involved in cargo pilotry, or you know, cargo plane, the cargo plane industry. In fact, they were the ones that first introduced Scott to Madeline, who was actually working for them at the time, as they were the owners of the cargo plane business that she worked for. When they first learned that their son and his children had not perished years earlier in a tragic plane explosion, but were alive and well, they invited them to visit. But due to it being the busy season, Philip and Deborah sent Madeline to meet and escort their family home to meet them because they, you know, were too busy to get there to greet them. Eventually, Philip and Deborah would sell their company to Nathaniel Essex. Years later, Philip would also end up meeting Adam X, who would later be revealed as the half Shi'ar, half mutant brother of Scott, Alex, and Gabriel. Philip was losing his eyesight at the time and he lost control of his plane while flying, crashing, when Adam X happened to be passing nearby and decided to offer aid. Adam X saved Philip's life, but could not save his eyesight, and he would sadly go blind. Paying a visit to Philip in the hospital, he would run into Scott's then wife, Jean Grey, and have her link his mind to Philip's so that he could share with him memories of what Philip had most longed for in his life, to be a pilot in outer space, which Adam X had been during his time working for the Shi'ar. I just love that story. I think it's so sweet. As is typical, like with the late Catherine Summers, mother of Scott, Alex, Gabriel, and Adam X, and wife of course hair, we do not know much about Deborah's heritage at all. But we do know a few things about Philip's heritage, so let's talk about that. Namely, we know he had an aunt named Gloria Dane, who was the daughter of his grandmother, Amanda Mueller, and likely a man that she hooked up with at some point, who I guess his last name was Dane. The kind of weird thing about this is that although Gloria was Philip's aunt, she's actually most likely younger than him in terms of when she was born. She was born in 1950 while well, he served in the military in World War II, so figure that out. This can likely be explained by the fact that his grandmother Mother, Gloria's mother, Amanda, was immortal thanks to her mutant power. But we'll talk more about Amanda in a little bit. Gloria Dane went by the alias of Fontanelle and was a mutant with telepathic abilities, specifically good at deciphering and reading people's dreams. Originally, Fontanelle appeared as someone hired to figure out Gambit's involvement with the mutant massacre. However, after her contract to do so was terminated, she instead changed sides and decided to help Gambit uncover the mystery behind the person who had hired her new son, who turned out to be an alternate version of Gambit himself, actually, and help him to also figure out the mysterious woman known as Black Womb, who turned out to be Gloria's own mother, Amanda Mueller. This is probably a good as time as any to discuss the rumored connection of Gambit to the Summers family. And answer the question, is Gambit a Summers? Although at the time of this recording, to kind of answer that question, all it really remains, at least in the main continuity, is a rumor. After Mr. Sinister teased about a third Summers brother, there was much speculation as to who this could be. Initially, Fabian Nisaea worked to leave a trail of breadcrumbs that led to Adam X, who was revealed to be the genetic son of Shi'ar Emperor Daken and Catherine Summers in the comics. Following that, there were hints that it might be Gambit, whose birth parents remain unknown in the comics. To help this rumor sort of gain more momentum, in an alternate future known as Earth 41001, seen in Christopher Claremont's X-Men the end, an alternate version of Gambit is revealed to be the hybrid clone of both Mr. Sinister and Scott Summers. Although in my opinion, that would actually make him more the genetic offspring of the two characters than Scott's and Alex's brother. It would be more like, you know, Gambit is the son of Sinister and Scott together, which is a weird thought. Gambit, however, has never been established as a clone of either Sinister or Cyclops in the main continuity. Or at least, he hasn't been yet. A few years later, Vulcan was introduced in Ed Brubaker's X-Men Deadly Genesis, where he was revealed as the third Summers brother. Gabriel, being the son of both Catherine and Christopher Summers. As with much of comic book continuity though, it's good to keep in mind that it's quite fluid. But while it could change at any point, this is the latest in regards to where we are at with the third Summers brother rumor and revelation in the main continuity, with Vulcan being established currently as the answer to that mystery. Back to the mysterious Amanda Mueller though. Who is she and what or who is Black Womb? Amanda Mueller is Scott's Alex's and Gabriel's great great grandmother, and has been speculated to be where the Summers X gene potentially originates. Amanda is also the mother of Philip's unnamed father, 
and of Philip's aunt, Gloria Dane. As a young woman, she grew up in the 19th century and ended up entering into a deal with Nathaniel Essex after he discovered her mutant genes were very powerful and very formidable. The deal was she would marry and conceive children, but feigned that the pregnancies didn't actually come to term while actually delivering the newborns to Essex so that he might study their genetics. In exchange, it's believed that she was paid handsomely. Well, we don't know much about Mr. Dane, who was Gloria's father and presumably was at some point married to Amanda, we do know about her previous husband, Daniel Summers. He was the grandfather of Philip Summers, who likely never knew Philip, as he left his wife and son after Amanda was accused of being the black womb killer. His son would grow up, likely get married and have a son of his own, becoming Philip's father. As a mutant, Amanda Mueller's powers involved longevity, rendering her essentially immortal but not immune to the effects of aging, so her age continued to show and affect her appearance over time. Amanda Mueller would go on to become the leader of the government-run Black Womb Project, of which Kurt Marco, Brian Xavier, and Irene Adler were also a part of, with Kurt Marco and Brian Xavier even involving their own offspring, Cain Marco and Charles Xavier, in their experiments. At one point, Amanda Mueller attempted to steal Mr. Sinister's powers, but she failed, and whether alive or dead, she hasn't really been spotted since then. Philip's estranged grandfather, Daniel Summers, and his father, Oscar, are both interesting mind trips as well. Before Daniel married or even met Amanda Mueller in America, he actually lived in London, in England, and he was known by the name of Danny Edge. Danny's parents were murdered when he was young, and he ended up kidnapped by a group known as the Marauders. Not the current heroic Marauders that we know from the comics, though, led by Captain Kate Pride, but Nathaniel Essex's Mr. Sinister's first ever Marauders group. Essex had people kidnapped so that he might experiment on and keep them underground in secret in the sewers. However, Danny was one of the victims of Essex, who was saved from Sinister's mad science by the time-traveling X-Men, Cyclops, and Phoenix, aka Scott Summers and Jean Grey. Yeah, I know! After being freed, he and a former member of the Marauders by the name of Oscar Stamp fled the UK to start a new life in America. At immigration, Oscar Stamp and Danny Edge claimed to be father and son, and inspired by the heroes who'd freed them both, took the surname of Summers. Which means that Oscar was the adoptive, likely estranged, great, great, great grandparent of Scott and his brothers. Paradoxical! And that's pretty much as far back as we can go with the Summers family currently, in terms of ancestry. There are also ancestors on Jean's side of the family, but as I said in my previous Explained video, the Greys kind of really deserve their own list, because there's a lot of them. If there are other mutants you want to hear us explain the family trees of, let us know in the comments, by the way, because I would love to dive into some more mutant family tree histories for you. The Frosts also have an interesting family tree as well, which could also be relevant in a video like this, as although I didn't focus on it in the previous video, Emma Frost is also known for being a major love interest of Scott's. Although the two were never formally wed, there are many alternate realities where the two of them have children as well. We focused on some of the more prominent Summer's children in regards to their ties to the main continuity, but now we're going to dive into some of the more obscure ones as we discuss even more Summer's family alternate kids. Speaking of Emma Frost, let's start off with another popular child of Scott's who happens to be the child of both he and Emma in an alternate version of the Days of Future Past reality. That's right, we're talking about Ruby Summers. While the original Days of Future Past reality is known as Earth 811, Ruby hails from the alternate of that alternate designated Earth 1191, the same reality that Lucas Bishop also hails from. Here, Ruby is the daughter of Scott Summers and Emma Frost. In this reality, Ruby was given her name by the time displaced Layla Miller, a mutant who, unrelated to her mutant powers, also has precognitive abilities granted to her by her future self. Ruby also ends up falling in love with Trevor Fitzroy in this reality. Ruby is one of the mutants who ends up helping return Layla Miller and Multiple Man, aka Jamie Madrox, do their own timeline. And she's just super cool. People love her. She's got a Ruby form. She's pretty awesome. In the Earth 1191 reality, a splintered alternate version of Cable exists, who is half brother to Ruby. His his whole existence is super confusing, but basically, this version of Cable is responsible for bringing the mutant Messiah here, whose power caused an extermination level event, which led to the Sentinels attacking the mutants. This is the future that Bishop warns us against during the Messiah Complex event, and which he is trying to prevent from happening. But you know, it happens anyways. In the alternate future of X Men.
mend the end, Cyclops also has multiple children with Emma Frost, including their psionic daughter, Megan Summers, two also psionic unnamed twin girls, and a son named Alex. There is also an alternate version of Nathan Summers in this reality, who is the son of Scott and Madeline, and goes by the codename Cable again. And Scott and Jean also have a daughter together in this reality named Rachel Summers, who goes by the codename of Marvel Girl. Gambit, who is also connected to the Summers family tree in the X-Men The End reality, also has children with his wife, Rogue. Together, they have three children. Their adopted daughter, who takes the name of Anne Marie for herself and uses the alias No Name, Olivier, or Ollie, who goes by the alias Olivier Raven, and Rebecca Raven LeBeau. And obviously, because, you know, Gambit is kind of tied to the Summers. In that reality, this makes sense. Aside from these alternate children, Alex Summers, aka Havoc, also has another child from an alternate reality as well. Like Katie Summers, his son Scotty also hails from an alternate reality. This is a reality that Alex's consciousness was displaced to after being caught in a time machine explosion. Known as Mutant X, in the reality of Earth 1298, the X Men team are instead known as the Six, and this reality's Alex was actually their leader. Havoc awoke inside his alternate self body to learn that here, he and his wife Madeline Pryor had a son named Scott Charles Summers. After the birth of their child and the displacement of Alex of Earth 616's consciousness into his alternate self's body, Madeline would end up possessed and would basically become the Goblin Queen in this reality. While their son would save her temporarily, eventually she would revert to the Goblin Queen once more and it was during Havoc's fight against her that he was sent back through a time rift and basically ended up back in his own body and on his own world in Earth 616. In this reality, Alex also had another genetic daughter in Raven LeBeau. She is the adopted daughter of Belladonna and Gambit, who is genetically created by honorary Summers family member, Mr. Sinister, using the combined genes of Alex Summers and Jean Grey. Raven also has a genetic brother created by Mr. Sinister using Summers and Grey DNA, known as Nate Grey, whose origins are similar to that of his Earth 2 295 AOA counterpart. AOA being Age of Apocalypse. There are many clones who have cropped up over the years in regards to the Summers family tree, but listing all of them would take a while. We covered some of them on the first part of our video explaining the Summers family tree, but I left out a pretty odd one who is also connected to self-inserted family tree member Mr. Sinister as well. Zraven. <laughs> Zraven is a weird one. He is a genetically created offspring who is technically related to both Scott and Jean, and also related kind of to Mr. Sinister and a bunch of other people as well. Well, Mr. Sinister created Zraven in the main continuity of Earth 616, combining together the DNA of the original X Men team, the original Kraven the Hunter, and the Carnage symbiote, with Sinister being Zraven's creator. Sinister attempted to use Zraven to acquire more samples of mutant DNA, but ultimately, Zraven would rebel against him after learning from Cyclops the truth about, you know, how Sinister treats his favored creations and experiments. Zraven dodged a bullet there, really. While there are likely more clones and alternate reality children, I could focus on for this video, I'd like to take a moment to also acknowledge one more grandchild that I left out on part one. We talked about Hope Summers and Tyler Dayspring there, but now we're talking about the alternate reality grandson of the alternate reality Gene and Scott from Earth 967. Hyperstorm is the son of Rachel Summers and Franklin Richards, a pretty weird combination if I do say so myself. Jonathan Richards hails from the alternate reality of Earth 967, which is yet another alternate take on the alternate alternate reality of Earth 811, Days of Future Past. Here Scott and Jean have another daughter named Rachel Summers and she ends up falling in love with and marrying the son of Sue Storm and Reed Richards Franklin. As such, Hyperstorm is known for being extremely powerful, wielding a force known as the Supreme Force, which in essence allows him to tap into the infinite psionic power of hyperspace to accomplish many impressive feats. Jonathan is also known for his beyond genius intellect. And although I could talk about Summer's family all day, we've pretty much covered most of the family tree at this point, and also I'm pretty much out of time. Though there still might be some alternate reality kids and grandkids to discuss if you would like on a potential part three. If that's what you want, you let me know. And of course, a few more clones that I could also talk about because there are always clones, especially when Mr. Sinister is around. Like Magneto, Wolvie has a bunch of names too throughout the years, including one of my favorites, Patch. And also like Magneto, he has a very tragic origin story, one that we've seen explained multiple times, both in the comics and in Wolverine Origins, the film. 
which is a movie that happened. Oh boy, did it happen. And also, like Magneto, Wolverine started out as a villain in the comics, albeit much more briefly, and I guess more of an antagonist than a straight up villain, making his first appearance as the Hulk's adversary in the Hulk's own comic series, launching a rivalry that has actually spanned decades. Is it weird that I keep comparing Wolverine to Magneto? Yeah. Let's stop doing that and jump into this family tree. Initially, all we knew of Wolverine was that he was a mutant, and in fact, it was even suggested in the beginning that the adamantium claws that he possessed themselves were actually genetic. It wouldn't be till later that we'd actually learn the adamantium on his skeleton was actually added later on by Weapon X through a painful bonding procedure that few test subjects could survive, let alone benefit from. With the main time that we all kind of figured that out being when Magneto stripped the adamantium from him. That was a thing that was very memorable. Before he was Wolverine though, who was Wolverine? Well, if you ever asked Logan himself, he actually might struggle to answer this question due to all the tampering done to his mind, as well as years of both physical and emotional trauma that his brain had suffered and healed from. It's actually believed that the reason why Wolverine doesn't often remember things from his past is because his brain heals over painful memories and that scar tissue and his healing factor's self-preservation instincts could contribute to memory loss. But also, Wolvie has been shot and stabbed in the head. A lot, which I think would mess with anybody's memories if they could heal. Definitely not. If you couldn't heal, well, you wouldn't have any memories because you'd be a dead guy. However, while Wolverine might struggle to remember his many pasts, fans of the characters likely won't, or fans that have read his many pasts, anyways, including origins. Before Wolverine was a superhero or even was known by the name of Logan, he was James Howlett. James grew up as a sickly child who actually was perhaps lucky that he even made it to the point of his mutant powers manifesting. Although, I guess when you consider just how that happened, and then everything that came after that, and all of Logan's life, Logan might not see himself as being quite so lucky. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's head back to Wolverine's origins. James was raised as the youngest son of a wealthy couple, John Howlett Sr. and his wife Elizabeth Howlett, who lived in Alberta, Canada. However, in truth, he was actually the biological son of Elizabeth and the Howlett's groundskeeper, Thomas Logan, born out of an affair between the two. At least, that's was heavily implied. John Sr. Howlett may have still been James's biological father, but as I said, it is heavily implied that he was not. Still, John raised James as if he were his own anyway. Whether this was because he was not aware of his wife's affair or simply because he just felt it was the right thing to do, despite her infidelity. Seeing James still as one of his own. We don't really know that much about John Sr. Howlett, although he seemed to have a kind heart, but it is implied that he was the one to deal the death blow to John Jr., James's older brother, doing so in defense of their mother, Elizabeth, after John Jr.'s powers, because he also had powers, manifested and he went into a rage. This likely weighed on John Sr. heavily. Also, yes, if you were wondering, Wolverine had a brother. We'll talk about that more in a bit. Elizabeth Hudson Howlett was Wolverine's mother. Hudson was Elizabeth's maiden name and would actually be a very important name when it came to Wolverine's story later in life. But we'll get back to that in a bit. And it seems likely that when it comes to Logan's ex gene, he may actually get it from her side of the family or from his biological father's side or, you know, a combination thereof. Though, more than likely, I think it's from Elizabeth. Elizabeth's side of the family. She gave birth to not one mutant, it turns out, but two! Though both sons may have been fathered by Thomas Logan, in the alternate reality of Earth 4011 that appears in Wolverine The End, it is stated that Elizabeth is where Wolverine gets his X gene from. Now, of course, that's not main continuity, but still, some people feel like that's, you know, could also apply to the main continuity. The traumatic and life threatening experience she had with her first son is implied to be what caused her to be sent to a mental institution. Eventually, though, she would return but life would forever be changed at the Howlett estate, with Elizabeth mostly preferring to hide in her room, even neglecting her younger son James as a result. As we have previously stated, young James also had an elder brother who passed away, John Jr. Howlett. John Jr. Howlett may have also truly been the biological son of Elizabeth and Thomas Logan, the groundskeeper, but we don't really know that for sure. What we do know is that John Jr. died young, after apparently also being born a mutant. It's believed that his father killed him out of defense of his mother, who he had attacked. Some believe to this day that John Jr. may even still be out there somewhere, alive, possessing powers similar to Wolverine, despite the fact that Wolverine seemed to see his older brother during time spent in hell. Which I think would be pretty crazy if we brought him back, but also, I feel like if we haven't seen him at this point, where has he been? Aside from his elder brother who passed away, young 
and James also had a half brother in Dog Logan. Dog was the son of Thomas Logan and an unnamed woman. He grew up on the Howlett estate and became one of James's playmates, along with Rose, who was brought in to live in the estate as a playmate for James, while also being given serving duties as she got older. Dog at one point saved James's life after accidentally endangering it. However, Dog's feelings for Rose and forceful actions towards her, as well as his jealousy of James and all that he stood to inherit, drove a wedge between them as they grew up. Eventually, this division led Dog to attack James, causing him physical and emotional harm, with Dog and his father evicted from the estate as a result of this. Oddly enough, Dog somehow survived to the modern age, despite having been born like Wolverine in the late 19th century. At one point, he has a bunch of time diamonds, which I guess he could use to time travel, so this could be how he's lived so long. Or, you know, perhaps his longevity is still as of yet an undefined power of his. We haven't seen him for a while, but still. Pretty sure we saw him at least in like 2014 or something. So, considering it's the 19th century and then we see him in a comic from 2014, that's a little. <laughs> what's happening there? We don't know. Thomas Logan is heavily implied to be the biological father of James Howlett, which seems to have been why he used Logan as an alias in the past. Although, as I said previously, James's mind also became so addled that eventually he would not remember his true name as James Howlett and would forget the connection of that name, Logan, to his biological father. So, he might have just picked that name he thought randomly, but it wasn't so random. In fact, when Dog eventually comes to look for James and Rose years after they have fled the estate, James initially does not even recognize Dog or remember who he is or that he's a Logan. Thomas was a hard man, driven to drink and often behaving aggressively, especially towards his own son who lived with him, Dog. In fact, this is likely a big part of the reason that Dog turned out the way he did. After both Thomas and Dog were removed from the Howlett estate, Thomas snuck back onto the property killing the Howlett servants and using Rose to gain access to Elizabeth's room, and of course bringing Dog along with him. There Thomas attempted to get Elizabeth to run away with him before being confronted by John Sr., who Thomas then just killed. This is what caused James's mutant powers to manifest, as he sort of came into all this chaos, and in a blind fit of loss, desperation, and rage, he scarred Dog and killed Thomas with his bone claws. The trauma of the whole occurrence and its similarity to the tragic event of her first son proved too much for Elizabeth, who blamed herself and took her own life. James and Rose, also overwhelmed, chose to leave the estate, fleeing together. If you thought Thomas Logan was bad, well, I mean, you would be right, but while John Sr. seems like a well-meaning sweetheart by comparison, his own father was more akin to Thomas than his own son in terms of his cruelty. We don't know his name, but Mr. Howlett, or the old man as he was sometimes referred to, is the grandfather of Wolverine and the father of John Sr. He was the one who forged the Howlett name and created their fortune through unknown means. The old man was critical of John Sr. and his offspring and may have even at one point threatened the life of young John Jr. because of his mutant gene. He constantly harped on John Sr. criticizing his parenting skills as he felt James was too weak and too soft. After Dog blamed Rose for the deaths of Thomas, John Sr., and Elizabeth, Mr. Howlett disowned James, although he did still help him and Rose escape town and years later would actually come to regret sending his grandson away, giving Dog, then his heir and ward, information to help track James and Rose down once more so that he might actually make amends. However, Dog, of course, had some other plans. He was like, yeah, I'll do that. I'll totally do that. I'm not going to go and try to kill this person who stands to potentially take an inheritance away from me that I just got. Wouldn't do that at all. <laughs> oh yeah, he definitely tried to do that. From the beginning almost, young James's life was steeped in tragedy. A tragedy so great, in fact, that he wouldn't even remember most of it as time went on. That's how great it was. <laughs> not even Rose, who also tragically died by accident at Wolverine's claws during a fight between him and Dog, after Dog had tracked him down with information given to him by the old man. Wolverine would see Rose's spirit and visions when close to death, but not remember her or his own past. He would often mistake her for Jean instead, which kind of makes sense because Rose and Jean do look very similar. And Jean herself has also, of course, appeared in Wolverine's death visions in spirit form. Often too, because you know, half the time Jean happens to be dead in the comics, it seems anyways. So that makes sense. However, this is only the beginning of Wolverine's tragedies. Tragedy would plague Wolverine throughout his family tree 
even extending through his mother's heritage and her own family, the Hudsons. Elizabeth Hudson had two brothers, Elias and Frederick. Both survived their parents, who died tragically in a shipwreck. Everything is a tragedy when it comes to any story attached to Wolverine. Even his mother's family couldn't escape this comic book curse. Elias seems to have been the older brother as he was the one who ended up running the family business, the Hudson Bay Company, which by the way is a real department store company that has strong ties and roots in Canada, so I kind of love that the Hudsons are related to the Hudson Bay Company. Wolverine even at one point unknowingly works for his uncle Elias, who was later driven to take his own life, shortly after Wolverine left. Mental health seems to be something that the Hudsons struggled with throughout their history. Probably something Wolverine should watch out for. Actually, I feel like Wolverine has also struggled with that, so I mean we all struggle with that, so fair enough. Frederick, however, ended up working with the Canadian military, overseeing a training facility. A facility that ended up being used by notorious and often confusing Wolverine villain Romulus, who was retconned to have been the mysterious figure making Wolverine's life even more tragic the whole time. <laughs> like he even needed help in that department at all, Romulus. Jeez. And of course, as Romulus enters the equation, here is where Hudson's involvement with Wolverine gets really weird, but kind of great, but really weird. Logan ended up at the military training facility where Victor Creed, aka Sabretooth, and Silas Burr, aka Cyber, and currently known as Hornet, would also be. Under orders from Frederick, who did not know that Logan was his nephew, Burr was instructed to make Logan's life living hell in order to turn him into a loyal killer. Another of Romulus's agents, Janet, was also used to manipulate Logan through having him fall in love with her. But not of course so she could persuade Logan to do what she wanted, as you can kind of do with people that you know love you, you can kind of convince them of things, but unbeknownst to her so she could be basically fridged, aka killed, thereby motivating Logan in one way or another. Another classic Romulus plot. Frederick himself would later be killed on Romulan's orders by his great nephew Dawkin, aka Akahiro, the son of Wolverine. Frederick never had any children with his wife, but did have an illegitimate son with his secretary, whom she vengefully named Frederick Hudson II in order to hurt Frederick's relationship with his wife. Take that, Frederick. His secretary, Caitlin McDonald, took her own life sadly shortly after giving birth. While Frederick didn't do much of note in his own life, he did have three sons who are pretty relevant. Truette, Victor, and James. Frederick II himself died young as the result of a bar brawl, which is a pretty fitting way to go for anyone who's related to Wolverine. Truett Hudson, often referred to simply as Wolverine's cousin, though more specifically Wolverine's first cousin once removed, is one of the most important of the three. Truett is also known in the comics as the Professor. And while he is also bald, we are not talking about that Professor. Not Charles, aka Professor X. Instead, Truett was the professor, also known by the alias Professor Thornton, who became tied to the Weapon Plus program, likely inspiring it as a result of stumbling into a lab in a World War II German camp that actually belonged to, get this, Nathaniel Essex, aka Mr. Sinister. What a strange connection I never thought would exist, and yet it does. From there, Weapon Plus would later spawn the creation and project known as Weapon X on their journey to create new super soldiers. This was following the success of Project Rebirth, which led to the creation of Captain America, who was labeled by the program as Weapon 1. The professor would later be put in charge of brainwashing Team X operatives, among them Logan included, and would be known as director of the Weapon X program. Yeah, that's the thing. That is literally his first cousin once removed, who was running that program. Druid actually also has ties to Dracula, another famous Wolverine enemy. Druid himself would be killed seemingly and surprisingly by Silver Fox, who at this point was believed to have actually been alive this whole time, and also now be evil and working for Hydra. And if you don't remember Silver Fox, she's one of Wolverine's first loves. However, in this reality, this probably wasn't actually Silver Fox, but a mutated clone of her. At least, all us Silver Fox fans are hoping that's what happened. Hopefully it's not really Silver Fox. To this day, I think a lot of people say, ah, that's a clone. Victor is the middle child of Frederick II. He himself was also manipulated by Romulus, because isn't everyone. He acted as Romulus's right hand man and was shown to be extremely durable and strong, although I don't know if we ever found out if he was a mutant or not. Victor was also born mute as well as blind. He met his end at the hands of Wolverine. Continuing right along with the three McDonald Hudson brothers, we also have James Hudson. That's right, Guardian of the 
Alpha Flight. Andrew, are you proud of me? I found a way to work Alpha Flight into this video. Although, considering Wolverine's history with the team, that really shouldn't be hard in general to do while talking about him because he himself has also, you know, been a pretty good ally and sometimes team member of Alpha Flight. But anyways, this isn't about Wolverine's life story. This video is about his relatives and his family connections. Enter James Hudson, also Wolverine's cousin and half-brother to the villainous Truette. Half-brother because all three brothers actually had different mothers. James was the youngest of the three, which means I got to save the best for last. Before Guardian was Guardian, James Hudson developed a suit for Amcan Oil Corporation to be used to help locate underground oil deposits. However, after he learned his suit was going to be sold to the US military and used as a weapon, which he was not here for, nah -uh -uh, he destroyed its plans and stole the helmet of the suit, making it unusable. He then went to the Canadian government for help and protection from Amcan Oil. He would go on to become founder of Department H and the leader and founder of Alpha Flight. James Hudson and his wife, Heather McNeil Hudson, aka Vindicator, would also become fast friends with technical relative James Howlett, ever since they ran into a feral Logan on their honeymoon as seen in Alpha Flight issue number 33, which has a flashback to that. James and Heather have one daughter together, Claire, who would be, I think, a cousin twice removed to Wolverine. So that's also a thing. John Sr. and Elizabeth aren't the only ones with relatives relevant to Wolverine's history though. Thomas and the Logans also have an extensive past and at least one relative that you might find at least interesting. Folk burn Logan. If Wolverine were to run his DNA through someplace like Ancestry.com, he'd learn that one, he probably has a lot more kids than he ever knew about. And two, that he was also related to Folkburn Logan. Folkburn lived back in the 11th century and is referred to by his fellow soldier and friend as the last pagan living in London, England. Folkburn runs into Thor and the Horsemen of the Apocalypse during a fight between them and is saved by Thor himself. Just as he begins to pray to the old gods, hilariously, which I love, as seen in Uncanny Avengers issue number six. Well, this pretty much covers all of Logan's family when it comes to where he comes from from and his origins, there's a lot more tragedy ahead for us to explore when it comes to romance and his own offspring. We're running a little short for time on this video, so I'm going to briefly cover some of the major wives slash loves and children we've come to know as related to Wolverine in the main comic book continuity of Earth 616. But if you enjoyed this video and you want a specific video about Wolverine's kids, let us know in the comments. Or if you would rather perhaps something a little different, such as hearing me attempt to explain the history of Weapon X or or attempt to explain Mr. Sinister's family tree instead, both of which would probably also be a lot of fun. Be sure to let us know. When it comes to Wolverine's wives, there are two main ones that stick out to me. One of whom he was actually married to, another he was almost married to, but you know, I think we can still count her. She's a pretty big deal. Other than Jean Grey and his weakness for redheads, the major loves of Wolverine's life, I would say, would be Mariko Yoshida, his fiance, and Itsu, his wife. Although Wolverine was also shown to be married to the ancestor of a person named Hoshiko in the story Aftermath in Wolverine Exit Wounds, and was once also married to Ophelia Sarkissian, aka Viper. That's a thing that happened. With Mariko, their love did not produce any offspring, but it was a strong love regardless. And they did have a foster daughter together, so that's a thing. Mariko was introduced in X-Men issue 118, and we'd come to know her as the daughter of Lord Shinjin, the leader of Clan Yoshida, a crime syndicate in Japan. Mariko is also a cousin to Mutant Sunfire, which was how she first met Wolverine. The two fell in love and eventually ended ended up engaged after the death of Mariko's father. However, due to the manipulations of Mastermind, their wedding would be called off. Later, it would be back on but delayed until Mariko felt she had made right the wrongs that Mastermind's influence over her had caused. She died before they could be married though. While she would be resurrected much later, her and Wolverine's relationship would never really recover. Itsu is the wife of Logan, who he met, fell in love with, and married during his time training with Bando Saburo in Japan. Itsu became pregnant but was unfortunately assassinated by by Bucky Barnes, aka the Winter Soldier, before her child could be born. Initially, it was actually believed that their offspring did not survive, but later we learned that thanks to the power of the baby's X gene, it actually did survive. The baby was retrieved by Romulus, who left him on the doorstep of a well off couple that would adopt him. However, Romulus would also manipulate this baby, named Akahiro, but cruelly nicknamed Dokken, and now known by the codename Fang, to grow up to hate his father. His biological father, Wolverine, that is. Dokken would attempt to destroy Logan 
Logan while working for the Red Right Hand, seeking out those who were Wolverine's offspring that he either never knew existed or had forgotten about due to, once again, much tampering with his mind and just overall memory loss, and using those relatives as weapons against their father. This group was known as the Mongrels. They died at Wolverine's hands without him knowing of their true origin till after he'd killed them all. Tragedy. Tragedy. At one point, Dokken and Wolverine would be pitted against one another by the machinations of Sabretooth, leading to Dokken tragically being drowned by his own father in a puddle. But don't worry, he returned and later would reconcile with his dad, and now he isn't even known by the name Dokken, but prefers to be addressed as Akihiro or Fang. Other prominent offspring of Logans from the main continuity include Laura Kinney, aka X23, who is also now known as Wolverine, his daughter, and also his female clone, Gabrielle Gabby Kinney, aka Scout, a clone of Laura, who is also seen as Wolverine's daughter, and Amiko, his adopted daughter who has spent a lot of time being raised by Wolverine's good friend Yukio and previously was raised in part by Wolverine's love and fiance Mariko, prior to her death of course. Who is Mr. Sinister? Mr. Sinister was originally known as Nathaniel Essex. He is one of the greatest mutant geneticists the world over. Over the years, he has perfected the cloning process, created chimeras, sparked new life, altered his own DNA to make himself mutant, manipulated others' power increasing, decreasing, or better focusing them, and has augmented victims with his own DNA, altering them forever by kind of bonding them to himself. <laughs> Before we travel back in time to the beginning of Mr. Sinister's weird and wacky story and origin, let's talk about his comic book origins in regards to his first chronological appearance. Mr. Sinister was first mentioned following the devastating attack on the Morlocks, often referred to in the comics as the Mutant Massacre. Following the attack in issue 212 of Uncanny X-Men, we get the first mention of him. Wolverine is hot on the trail of those responsible attempting to hunt them down when he runs into Sabretooth, because of course Sabretooth is involved in this dastardly plot. Startled by Sabretooth's appearance in the sewers, but not at all shocked, Wolverine exclaims, You're part of this? Sabretooth responds, Yep, adding, Mr. Sinister's dealing a game that don't allow for wild cards like the Morlocks, or you ex chumps either. So he sent the Marauders to resolve the situation. Cause we're the very best there is at what we do, like you used to be. This was the first mention of Mr. Sinister, who would make his first visual appearance almost 10 issues later in issue 221 of the series. Sporting pointed teeth and a scowl that to gaze upon would likely leave you paralyzed with fear, Mr. Sinister's ghostly white nightmarish face appears on the very first page of this issue. He lets out a growl expressing his disappointment in how the team have failed to eliminate one of his creations, Madeline Pryor, who he wanted destroyed and disposed of to cover up his own connection to her. You failed me, marauders, and failed Failure is something Mr. Sinister does not tolerate. I'm here for it. I'm here for the creepy stuff. Mr. Sinister is one of my favorites. Mr. Sinister's connection to both the Morlocks and Madeline Pryor run even deeper than you can imagine, though, and extend all the way back to Victorian England and the character's origins as he transformed from Nathaniel Essex, esteemed scientist, to something much more, well, Sinister. As a child, Nathaniel Essex loved watching the busy flow of traffic. He enjoyed studying the patterns of people's movement and predicting which way people would go, observing that they always seemed to follow preordained paths. This would be the beginning of Essex's obsession with predictions. In the limited team up series, Further Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix, we learn more about Essex's origins. I also just love the art in this series. It's kind of a cool series to revisit. I like that I get to do this video so I can revisit it. Here we learn that as a man, Mr. Sinister was actually a respected scientist who married Rebecca Milbury, back when he was of course Nathaniel Essex. Tragically, their young son passed away as the result of multiple birth defects. Struggling with grief, Nathaniel coped by burying himself in his work, struggling to accept the passing of his son. Essex became obsessed with Darwin's theory of evolution. He believed too many scientists were limited by their morals when it came to ideas and experiments. Why do we have morals? Morals. Ugh, what a waste of time! I don't have time for these morals. Essex predicted the existence of mutants, believing they would emerge as a result of natural evolution. He predicted that humanity would evolve rapidly thanks to what he referred to as Essex factors. 
You know, you're a scientist when you're naming things after yourself. As a result of this far out theory and questionable experiments, he was disgraced and kicked out of the Royal Society, though really due to his questionable experiments, which were pretty Frankenstein-ish to be honest. Around this time, Essex would ally with his first ever team of marauders. Uh, not these marauders. These marauders! And have them collect all sorts of deformed ne'er-do-wells from the streets of London to become his unwilling test subjects in mad science experiments. While working for Essex, the marauders woke up the powerful mutant known as Apocalypse, who had been in hibernation. Apocalypse asked to meet the leader of the marauders and was taken to him, posing as a man intrigued by Essex's theories on evolution. During their interaction, Essex learned that his predictions had been correct, as N. Sabiner was Apocalypse, a mutant. The duo ran into a time traveling Cyclops and Phoenix, who were sent back in time by the Ascani. While Nathaniel is tempted to join Apocalypse here, he ultimately instead decides to passionately commit himself to his family and his wife running home because Rebecca does not like how obsessed he has become of late with his work. Unfortunately, upon returning home, he learns that his wife, Rebecca, has learned of his uh, secret, very creepy experiments and his prisoners and has has um, freed them all. As a result of the stress of this revelation, she also went into early labor and is now basically on the brink of death. While on her deathbed, she refuses to forgive Nathaniel, labeling him as utterly and contemptibly sinister. Whew, fair, Rebecca's speaking some truths as she dies. Mourning the death of his wife and loss of his family, he ultimately returns to Apocalypse, deciding to become his ally in the end. I mean, I guess what else are you gonna do? Apocalypse is a mutant who perfectly represents Essex's hypothesis regarding mutants and evolution. Apocalypse is his theory, in essence, come to life. Apocalypse painfully genetically mutates Essex using celestial technology, making him his first prelate, which is also so you know, just how apocalypse do. With Nathaniel taking for himself the name his wife gave to him on her deathbed. Sinister. Sinister allowed Apocalypse to remove his humanity from him, leaving him with no moral code to speak of going forward. However, in his fight against Cyclops and Phoenix, he found himself pretty fascinated by them. Believing Apocalypse, his new master, to be cruel, without purpose, and therefore insane, Sinister decided to reject him, betraying him by unleashing a deadly plague that Apocalypse had him make, but only releasing it on his master, thereby forcing Apocalypse to return to hibernation. Sinister would go on to say that cruelty without purpose was ignorance, and that ignorance was the greatest enemy of science. But if you're cruel and you have a purpose, <laughs> then you're just apparently a great scientist to Mr. Sinister. Phoenix and Cyclops returned to the future, and while their mission to seemingly stop Apocalypse was successful, it would turn out that the true plan Clan Ascani had for them was to inspire Sinister to set into motion plans that would one day lead to the birth of Nathan Summers, aka Nathan Dayspring, aka Cable. So yeah, that's how close tied Mr. Sinister is to the Summers family. His obsession surrounding the Summers and the Greys in the future would actually come from his interaction with their future selves who had journeyed into the past. Wild, right? I hope you're following me with this timey-wimey stuff. In the 1999 Gambit comic series, we learned Sinister had moved from England to America. Sinister's appearance in Gambit series also makes sense given their history, where Sinister was shown to be a regretful ally, later enemy, who Gambit becomes indebted to. Although that wouldn't happen until the future. The future past, the future confusing. Time travel again. But we'll talk about that part later anyways. While in the Americas, Sinister would adopt the name of Dr. Nathan Milbury, taking his wife's surname. He would run the Essex Clinic as an obstetrician. There he would also continue to conduct morally devoid experiments and would even continue to study the genetics of Daniel Summers, one of his prisoners and test subjects back in England who had escaped. Or at least Daniel had thought he escaped Essex, apparently. He didn't, unfortunately. Sinister would also experiment on Amanda Mueller and made deals with her to acquire several of her babies after they were born for his own purposes. Amanda Mueller would go on to become one of the founders of Weapon X, an evil woman tied to the Summers family tree known as Black Womb. And Daniel Summers also tied. For more on Amanda Mueller and uh, Daniel, you can check out our part two video for attempting to explain the Summers family tree. Despite Gambit not actually being alive at the time in terms of like 
like he wasn't really born yet because it's the past, Sinister would first meet him in 1891. This was possible because Gambit and a shapeshifting mutant named Courier had traveled back in time. Upon meeting Sinister, the two made their first deal. Sinister agreed to free Thieves Guild members and give Gambit information in exchange for a sample of Courier's genome. Sinister would blend Courier's genes and abilities with his own and end up teaming up temporarily with Gambit. However, the Thieves Guild members involved would have their memories wiped and therefore would not remember these events. So, in case you're wondering why they don't remember, that's why. At this point, Sinister was not yet Mr. Sinister, to be clear, but was known simply as just Sinister. The name change might not seem like a big difference, but in regards to the character and his identity, it actually is. Mr. Sinister had a completely different personality in comparison, being more feral in nature. This personality actually developed after Sinister returned to his old home, the Milbury House, in 1895, to conduct more experiments. It was then that he learned he was dying and developed the Mr. Sinister persona. He had a kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing going on in regards to this split, struggling with episodes as he continued to deteriorate. Essex would run into Mystique and Destiny, who found him as part of their own investigation. They had him taken to Bedlam, where he died overnight. However, this wouldn't be the end for Sinister, as we learn in Immortal X-Men issue number 8. Mystique and Destiny would learn that prior to his death, Sinister had cloned himself four times, with the goal of surviving in clone form forms to the 20th century and beyond. Each one of his clones was marked by a symbol belonging to a different card deck suit. The Diamond clone is still known as Mr. Sinister and is a mutant. The clone of clubs we know as Dr. Stasis, who appears to be human. The other remain unknown at the time of this recording, though I imagine the Sins of Sinister event will shed some more light on their stories, and we might actually know more if there's something that I missed or didn't read, which if that's true, let me know in the comments because I'd love to read it. <laughs>